The second postulate we're going to discuss is the concept of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Now, this has to do with what we talked about in the previous video, which was observables and operators. But eigenvalues and eigenvectors is a lot more of a mathematical concept than it really is a physical concept. Okay, So, when we talked about the measurement of the observables in the previous video, we mentioned that we, when we use operators, we only get the possible values of that observable. Okay, Now, I also mentioned that when we use any of these operators, we're going to be using it on some function. Now, in future videos, we'll find out that the function, generally speaking, is the wave function, which describes the particle and gives all available information about the particle. So let's suppose that we're going to use this operator, just generic operator O. Let's suppose that we are going to operate on this function, which will eventually be the wave function. Okay. It turns out that the only allowed values for the measurement of that observable, so whatever observable is represented by this operator, that value is E right here. Okay. Okay. So if, for example, if this was the momentum operator, and I was operating that on the wave function, this value of E would be the, a possible value of the momentum. If this was the position operator, which in this case is X, if this was the position operator and I operated on the wave function, then this E is the possible value of position, okay, and so on and so forth. But this E has another stipulation that's very important. It has to be what's called an eigenvalue of the operator. It has to be an eigenvalue of the operator. Now this is getting into some complicated math, but I'm hopefully going to simplify this with an example of what this actually means. And I want you to notice before I go into the example that after we do the operation, after we do it and we get whatever is on the right side here, notice that on both sides we have exactly f of x. So for example, if f of x was sine of x, that was our function, sine of x, in order for this e to be a valid measurement, of the observable. I would have to have sine of x over here and exactly sine of x over here. So bear that in mind and let's look at an example. Suppose we have a third operator. Let's say this is our operator O3 or O hat 3 and let's say the operation is the first derivative with respect to x. Now let's define our function f of x. Let's say it's e to the kx. So I'm going to operate on f of x, O3 on f of x, which means taking the first derivative with respect to x of e to the kx. Well, operate on this, e to the kx. What do I get? Well, when I operate and do a derivative on an exponential function, I get the same function back, e to the kx, times the derivative of the inside function, kx, which is just k, which comes out in front here. Now notice, when I did this operation, when I did the first derivative on e to the kx, I get k times e to the kx. Notice on both sides of these equations, on both sides I have an e to the kx. I have them both in red here so you can see. That means that this k, which is in blue, first of all the k is the eigenvalue. It is the physical measurement of this observable and it's also valid. And it's only valid because I have the function on both sides of the equation, the function I was operating on. Okay. If I did not get e to the kx in any form on the other side, then this would not be a valid eigenvalue. Okay? And the way you can think about it is whatever function you originally operated on, you would have to be able to effectively cancel it out. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean you can actually cancel it mathematically here, but conceptually, you should be able to cancel out whatever function it is. And I could cancel out e to the kx. Okay? So whatever observable is represented by O3, K is A, a valid measurement, and it is the eigenvalue, because I have E to the Kx on both sides. Okay? All right, so now to illustrate the point further, let's, let's do another example. Let's define another operator, O hat 4, and let's say the operation is the second derivative with respect to X. Let's now define another function, G of X, and let's say it's sine of Kx. All right, let's do this fourth operator and operate on g of x, operate on sine k of x. That means we're going to take the second derivative of sine of kx with respect to x. So if we take the first derivative, we're just going to get cosine of kx with a k multiplied out in front because the inside function is kx and its derivative is k. But we still have to take another derivative, so we're going to differentiate cosine of kx. We would get sine of kx 
But remember, it's negative, because, so I'll have to throw a negative sign out in front and then multiply by k a second time. So overall, the second derivative of sine of kx with respect to x is negative k squared sine of kx. Okay? Notice when I write out this complete expression, operating on sine of kx is equal to negative k squared times sine of kx. Do we have sine of kx on both sides? The answer is yes. And you could effectively think of canceling those out, even though that's not mathematically valid here. So that means this negative k squared, this is, first of all, this is the, a possible measurement of whatever observable is represented by O4. Negative k squared is also the eigenvalue of this operator, and that therefore means it's valid, okay? Because you get sine of kx on both sides, all right? Eventually, we're going to see f of x and g of x. Those are going to be the wave function psi of x. And I want you to think about, before we conclude, what are possible general functions that psi of x or the wave function could be? Because we've seen here that we have to get something similar, in fact, identical, really, to what's on the left side as we have on the right, and that makes the eigenvalue valid. So we have e to the kx on both sides here, sine of kx on this side, okay? If we use a polynomial expression, let's say x to the fourth, if we take its first derivative, we would get something times x to the third. If we took the second derivative, we'd get something times x squared. And so you can see with polynomials, particularly when you're taking derivatives, you have a problem. The problem is, is the order of the function keeps dropping with every derivative that you take. And so you can imagine if we operated on, say, x to the fourth over here, we would then have an x to the third over here on the right side. So this begs the question, are certain functions better to have as wave functions? And the answer is yes. Almost every wave function, I think probably everyone that you're actually going to see in physical chemistry, is going to be either a sinusoidal function, as in sine or cosine, and normally sine, or an exponential function. So generally speaking, your wave functions are going to come pretty much in that form. Okay, exponential functions and sinusoidal functions. You will see some cosine functions, particularly when you get to spherical harmonics much later than this. Um, but generally speaking, they have to be in this form because when you take derivatives of sine and cosine, they loop around. You go from sine to cosine to negative sine to negative cosine back to sine. So those are, they loop around and you can have negatives, but that doesn't matter. And then with exponentials, you always get the function back. So that's actually good, okay? One other facet that's important. This value of e, this is the eigenvalue for whatever observable we're talking about. But this value can only have real numbers. In other words, you can't have complex slash imaginary numbers in it. Okay. So if you get a value that has i back, so i is imaginary number squared of negative 1, it is not valid, okay? So I just wanted to add that because we're actually gonna see that in a couple videos from now, all right? So hopefully this video helped you gain an intuitive understanding of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Join us in the next video where we talk about normalization of the wave function. Thank you.